Each Sunday in Advent, uh, thanks to the work of uh, Linda and Rod Hagland, we'll be um, seeing a part of Linda's collection of her Christmas nativity scenes or crash. And this week is the week of hope. And so they selected from her collection a series of crash scenes, where, as Linda said, they gaze at, uh, Mary and Joseph are gazing at the baby Jesus with uh, a particular attention, uh, perhaps recognizing the hope that he represented for, for them and for everyone in their time. The poet Emily Dickinson wrote, hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul. The psalmist declared, I put my hope in you all day long. Hope is more than wishful thinking. Hope is the spirit of God dwelling within us, reminding us we are never alone. Hope is our active commitment to be God's faithful people. When we light the candle of hope, we embrace God's presence among us yesterday and today and always. Whatever we face in life, we will put our hope in God. And we join in singing our Advent hymn, number one, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and we'll sing the first two verses and then the last two verses.
Well, good morning to all, the, um, all of God's children who might be tuning in today. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. So as you can see, we've already lit our Advent wreath. And I want to talk about some of the symbolism that comes in the wreath. Advent wreaths started to be used in the early 16th century in Germany. And actually, it was before the Reformation took place. So you often find that the Advent wreath is used in both Catholic and in Protestant churches. The circular shape of the wreath is a symbol of eternity. If you think about the Christmas tree, it's a triangle. But our Advent wreath is round because it symbolizes that God's eternal love is always with us. It's also made of evergreens, traditionally. The, the Advent wreath is made of evergreens, and evergreens have a special symbolism in the church as well. We know that other cultures, like our indigenous culture, use cedar to represent healing. And the evergreen in the Christian church is much the same. It symbolizes healing, new life, and again, eternal love that doesn't wither or fall off a tree. You'll also see on most wreaths, there's some kind of berry or pine cone, something that symbolizes new life. Like both berries and pine cones act as seeds. And so they symbolize new life and the birth that is coming with the birth of Jesus. And then ribbons are also very traditional. The ribbon symbolizes the... Um, how we are all connected, how we are all bound together by God's love. And the four candles, as we will be seeing over the next four weeks, we light one each week to symbolize the four, we four Sundays of Advent. This week we've lit, in, lit the, the candle of hope, peace. The pink one symbolizes joy, and we hope that on, this, on the Sunday of the pink candle, everybody takes a kind of a, a lighter load that day. And then love is the one we light on the fourth candle. The white candle in the center we light on Christmas Eve. So that's our Advent wreath, just a little better understanding of where all the signs and symbols come from. Good morning. Good morning. The scripture reading today is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 1 and 4 to 14. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders, which were carried away captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people 
whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. The word of God, amen. Let us pray. We stand at the threshold, O oh God, of a new season. We enter now into an Advent time of waiting and longing and hoping. Draw close to us in this time. Help us to feel your presence with us and speak to each heart the word it longs to hear this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night of Saturday, November 10th, 1979, CP Rail Train 54 began its journey starting on the Chesapeake and Ohio railway line in the northern United States, and then crossing into Canada, picking up more cars in Sarnia and then in Chatham, and among those cars were, was a tank filled with 90 tons of chlorine. They also picked up 39 cars filled with flammable butane and propane. The now 106-car train rolled out of Chatham with three locomotives and a three-person crew and they clipped along at about 80 kilometers an hour heading for Toronto on what was to be a, just one of many uneventful runs. Passing through the towns to the west of Toronto, heat began to build up in an improperly lubricated wheel on car 39. Residents in Milton, Ontario, living near the train tracks, reported seeing sparks arcing into the sky. It seemed like the train was on fire. Now in the suburbs west of Toronto, the sparking wheel came off. The train left its tracks at speed. Propane tankers overturned and they began to burn. An explosion roared 1,500 meters into the sky, and the night lit up like it was day. 
with the possibility of a deadly cloud of chlorine gas spreading through suburban Mississauga, more than 200,000 people were evacuated from their homes, my family living north of Port Credit included. On the day after the evening of the crash, on Sunday afternoon, the police moved through our neighborhood and ordered everyone to leave. So we went first to downtown Toronto where my sister lived with some friends and then needing a little more room for our family, we head out into the country to my aunt's farm near Caledonia and we were out of our homes for a week, a week in exile of sorts. The biblical scholar Marcus Borg writes that one of the central themes in scripture is the theme of exile and return. And maybe that's because exile and return is such a common human experience. Exile can be a literal event where we're forced to physically leave a familiar place, or exile can be figurative and our figurative exiles are no less consequential. In life, we are forced to leave familiar circumstances, to go into unfamiliar territory. Grief, loss, a change in significant relationships or family, a change in health, a change in employment, these kinds of things move us into a new and unfamiliar land, into a new place in life where we do not know how to make our way. The world around us changes and we feel in exile from the life that we have known. The reading that Shanti shared with us is from the book of Jeremiah and it's a letter written in a time of exile. It's a sober word and an encouraging word in a time of displacement. The people of God had been conquered, and as was the practice at the time, many of the citizens of the land were taken away into exile. There's no unrest in an empty land. Israel was forcibly taken to Babylon, and they were there in exile, not for a short time, but for 70 years. Jeremiah's letter is an encouragement to people longing to return to what had been. And the prophetic word isn't all warm and encouraging. He tells the people, that their exile will be long, longer than they would ever hope. His colleague Hananiah wrote that it would all be over soon, but Jeremiah was more realistic. But there's hope in Jeremiah's words as well. God says through the prophet, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. However long the exile, God is with you and God is offering hope. It may not be tomorrow, but it's coming. So how are we doing in our current exile? The pandemic has put us all in a new and unfamiliar place. Don't we all long to go home again back to the way things were before COVID hit us in March of 2020? Like Jeremiah's people, we might have hoped that it would be a short exile, but it's much longer than we had hoped. But the ex exile of COVID is lingering and lengthening. The Omicron variant that we're hearing about in the last few days, the rising case counts in other parts of the world suggest 
that the road ahead may still have a few twists and turns, a few obstacles to climb. But have hope, because there are signs that the return will come. It is, in spite of the exile we live in, it is getting better. We in Ottawa have 88% of our eligible population fully vaccinated, very close to the 90% that public health officials have long hoped for. Maybe we can remember when we were looking forward to our first vaccination, watching the internet to see when vaccines might become available. But now so many of us are double or triple vaxxed. We may have been waiting for children age five and up to be vaccinated, and now vaccinations are ongoing for those five and over, with 25,000 appointments being made in our city in the first week of vaccine eligibility. Our seniors have received a third dose booster. For those in long-term care, days of Lockdown and complete isolation, so hard at the time, it's behind us now. Georgina is able to lead worship in seniors' homes again. Personally, I was able to see my mother a couple of times in the last few months, something that was impossible for a long, long time. For younger people, the pandemic hit hard. They've been separated from the people and things that bring them joy. But I think of my, my daughter, Bronwyn, my youngest, uh, at Queens in Kingston. She's going to lectures in person. She's working in the University Center at Queens this fall. She helped lead an orientation for second years who could not have an orientation in their first year because everything on campus was closed and now everything is open again. In the church, our chancel choir, our adult bell choirs, they are meeting and practicing. Some of our scouts and guide group are meeting here in the church. Quilters and knitters are gathering here. Our children's play groups started up this week, and there are children's voices in our building again after such a long period of absence. Church meetings sometimes happen face to face. The Faces are masked, yes, but it's, it's progress. And do we remember the early days of COVID here in the sanctuary? Brian and Doreen were in the balcony. Elizabeth, Jenny, and I were in the chancel. And that was it. We hit our five-person limit. Ian could not sing. Andrew could not play. The pews were empty for months and months and months. And look at you all here today. There were periods of lockdown when none of us could even be here in the sanctuary, and we were preaching and singing to monitors at home. So there's been progress. First, the limit in the sanctuary became 15, and Ian and Andrew and Gavin were here, and there was piano and organ and violin in our webcasts, and now we have singing from Ian and, and Carmen, and we have people in the pews, and we're having communion together today, sharing it with those at home on the webcast. We baptized baby Sophia in the sanctuary in November, the first indoor baptism we have had in a long time. We've been celebrating the sacrament outside on the lawn, and now it is part of our webcast again. Do we remember times of lockdown when going to get groceries felt like an expedition into a hostile wilderness? Do we remember wiping our groceries and our grocery bags uh, down when we came home? Do we remember when park benches and play structures were blocked off with yellow emergency tape because we weren't allowed to sit or play in outdoor spaces? Do we remember when families could not gather at all in special occasions? And so it is getting better. The exile 
is long. It's not over yet, but there's hope. It's getting better. When Israel went into exile, it was hard. It was also a time of great learning and creativity. They wrote their stories down. They created their scriptures. They had a better understanding after the time of exile of who they were and what was important to them. And maybe we've been learning some things in our exile too about what our priorities should be, about what we value, about what in our March 2020 lives was stressful or restrictive and maybe can be left behind. Jeremiah also invites God's people to make a home in exile, to build houses, to plant gardens, to find joy. And we can reflect on how in our time of exile we have found life, we have found God, we have found connection. As we enter the season of Advent today, as we move into a liturgical time of waiting and longing and hoping, may we know hope, the hope of exiles knowing their return will come. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Amen. is invited to share at this table. All are invited, the younger and the older, the rich and the poor, the lowest and the least, sinners and saints together in communion. Come find your place here where there are no strangers or outsiders, only sisters and brothers in the sight of God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of our salvation, we are not deserving of your love, and yet you lavish it upon us, not being content 
tend to be apart from us. You came to us in human form, drawing close and becoming one with us. You are not a God that is removed from our lives and our reality. You are intimately present in our lives and our struggles. We lift up to you our thanks for your presence among us. We give thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, the very incarnation of your being on this earth. We remember how you called your servant Mary to bear the Christ child, how you called your servant Joseph to accompany her and your servant Elizabeth to encourage her, how you called the Magi to search and the shepherds to ponder, how you called the disciples to follow. With them, we remember that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, after having dinner with his friends, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, Jesus took the cup, and pouring it said, This is the cup of salvation shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For as long as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the resurrection of our living Savior until he comes again. As we wait in this sacred season of Advent, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We give thanks for your gifts of grace, loving God, and ask that your Holy Spirit would come to bless this bread and cup that we share, that we may live in expectation and hope, know your presence with us, and be your faithful people, sharing your love with our world. Jesus gathered with friends, and took bread and broke it, shared it with them, saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup blessed it, and shared it among them, saying, this is the cup of joy for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus Christ, the living bread. Jesus Christ, the true vine. we join together in saying the prayer that Jesus gave his friends. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you for joining us in worship today. It is good that we have been able to join at the table together again. We hold each other in prayer, but especially uh, our prayers are for Margot, for Marion, for Janet, and for the family of Jackie McKenna. I want to point out the gift of the red poinsettias that were donated by the UCW as thanks to everyone who has been so generous with their help um, and support for the UCW this year. So just a few notes about things that are coming up in this season of Advent. We're continuing our tradition of selling Zatun olive oil from Bethlehem and Palestine. Um, and if you are interested, it's $20 a bottle. If you're interested in purchasing some for yourself or for a gift, please let me know. Um, the olive oil is up in my office. Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we are going to be joining in a series of Advent retreats, and we're sharing again, once again with Kitchissippi United Church. All of these retreats are going to be on Zoom, and so if you want to get the coordinates for Zoom, please get in touch with one of the ministers. And our meditation group continues to meet on Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. Uh, Sandra and Jean Cloutier have set up an amazing collection of creche or nativity scene here in our chapel. And you're welcome to uh, go in and look after church or come to the church sometime and see them, providing you're wearing a mask and are fully vaccinated. We are still working out a schedule of volunteers to host the display. So um, if you want to come in this week, you'll have to call the church and make an appointment uh, and then we'll be publishing the times when somebody will be here to post the display. And Nessa Hopkin has an announcement to make about Christmas shoe boxes. Good morning. We started with the need for 119 shoe boxes and we have 80 shoe boxes left for women and children in need of support. If you are interested in in helping out, we will be here after church, and if you are online, you can go to the church, church website for more details and my mom's contact information. Thank you. Remember, you can give to Christmas Shoe Boxes, Christmas Cheer, the global outreach of our Mission and Service Fund, or our own ministry and programs here at Rideau Park. If you go to the website and look at the, the column for, um, for donating to the church. And to close, we sing hymn number 30 in our Red Voices United, Hail to God's Own Anointed, and we'll just sing the first two verses.
So let us go forth with the hope of exiles returning to their land, with the hope of those who await the Messiah, with the hope of God's people at work in the world. Let us go forth with the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.